It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. Change your attitude, change your life. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. You're listening to us in your neighborhood, from coast to coast, and around the world. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Joan Herman, author, speaker, and your host. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life brings you interviews with some of the most inspirational and influential people in the world. It's our goal to educate and empower you so you can live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. We have another great show for you today. Joining me today is Rebecca Musser, who as a young woman was forced into a polygamous marriage to the leader of the FLDS, an isolated sect of the Mormon faith. Rebecca became the leader's 19th wife, and upon her husband's death, she escaped from his son, Warren Jeffs, when he tried to force her to remarry. Today, Rebecca is a speaker, advocate for victims of human trafficking, and the author of the book, The Witness Wore Red. She's the founder of Claim Red, a nonprofit organization dedicated to bringing hope and healing to victims of human trafficking. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Rebecca, I was reading your book, The Witness for Red, and I have to tell you, in today's day and age in the United States of America, it is so hard to believe that people are living the way you did. So what was it like for you growing up in that environment? Growing up in a closed society like the FLDS, it was all that we knew. The information that we were given as children and what we were told was expected of us was very controlled from both the church authorities, but also my father and my mother and my father's other wives. There's a tremendous amount of mind control and grooming and programming that happens from birth to be able to condition the youth to think this is not only what is normal, but this is also what is expected of them to be able to gain their eternal salvation. And any kind of resistance to what you're being told to do does equal your eternal damnation. So there's extreme consequences for any action, either obedience or disobedience. It's either heaven or hell. Did you have any knowledge of the outside world? Did that influence your life in any way? We did have knowledge of the outside world. I grew up in Salt Lake City, in the heart of Salt Lake City, and yet we were told about the outside world that it wasn't if, it was when they would hurt us, that they were the wicked ones who would be destroyed by God, and that we were the one true chosen people of God on the whole face of the earth. I remember looking and thinking, how can all these people be bad? What a mean God to make the whole wide world just be evil and wrong, because I didn't see only ugliness. Our interaction with the outside world was limited, but sadly, it wasn't so much what the outside world did to us. It, that fear was infused in us by the church authorities to create a, tr a big gap between us and then the outside world, and it kept them, it kept the youth, which is, you know, their, their people supply, from being able to breach that gap and trust anybody except their authorities. For people on the outside, sometimes it's difficult for us to understand what really happens and how someone can gain so much control. But if that's all you know, and if your life is governed by fear, then it, it does make a lot more sense. And, and when did you realize that something wasn't right? When did you believe that you didn't fit in here any longer? I remember even as, as a child really struggling. I just couldn't fully accept everything that I was being told. And then I felt really wicked and ashamed that I questioned what my parents were telling me about God and also that I questioned my ability to, to go to heaven because I had this brain that I could not stop the questions from coming. And so it was a big struggle even as a child, but especially when I, at 19, was forced to marry Will and Jeff at 85, and I saw this man who was supposed to be God in mortality. I saw the very human side of him, and I experienced tremendous amount of sexual violation and abuse at his hand, and all the while being told, this is what God wants you to do. And that was really where the disillusionment started to happen. Everything we were told about the prophet and then seeing the reality of what he was, he was just a mortal man who, you know, had some very distasteful tendencies um, just toward women especially, and, and being completely okay with the subjugation of women 
that was very hard for me, and that was the defining factor that after seven years and, and he died, I could not stomach that anymore. I could not bring myself to do that again. Was there a lot of abuse taking place within that community? There is a tremendous amount of abuse on every single level. In my father's home, there was mental, physical, spiritual, sexual, in every kind, not just to me. And in societies like this, because of the shame around people's sexuality, I do have personal knowledge that it is rampant uh, in a group like the FLDS. The incest, the sexual violation is... They're, and they don't give the kids the ability to understand that their body is theirs, that they have the ability to say, no, you will not touch me. They are given no knowledge of that. It's just secret, and they are told, you be quiet. I mean, I was even threatened that if you tell anyone, I will kill your mother. And so it's it's time. And I think that in speaking out from from my story, Sexual violation is something that is rampant in every society, on every country, and there's so much shame attached to it. And I think that when one person speaks out, then it gives others the courage to be able to move and speak out about their own shame that they have carried. And it's time to be able to to bring light to this and to know that you're not alone in it and that there is healing possible and that we have the ability to create that change. So, Rebecca, when you decided to leave, were you free to go? How did you get out from under the control of, at this time, it was the sun? Uh, for me, I was not free to go. I did not tell anyone goodbye. I could not. They would not have let me leave. I left a note on my bed, and I slipped out in the middle of the night, and I actually had to climb up over this great big wall in my long skirt, long hair, and and then was able to escape to get, um, you know, from Utah all the way up to Coos Bay, Oregon. And it was very terrifying. It was at, to that point in my life, that was the scariest thing I'd ever done. But what I realized is it's one thing to leave a group like the FLDS, and it is a completely other issue to be able to get that FLDS mindset, the thinking out of each person, and in my case, me. And it was a big struggle, and it's something that I still work on regularly, and I work very hard on to, to undo the mental programming and to be able to learn better ways, healthier ways of integrating with life and personal expression. And it's quite a journey, but it is also a liberating one. On this show, Rebecca, we talk often about change and transition and getting through life challenges. And yours is an extreme case, but you had the strength to do what you knew needed to be done. And what was it like for you on the outside? How did you survive? I mean, I can't even imagine what the outside world must have been like for you. It was overwhelming. It was confusing. I had no idea to ha- how to handle the outward transformation, you know, even just like trying to figure out how to do makeup, mm-hmm. how what to do with short hair after I got my hair cut. It was overwhelming. And yet also the inward transformation that has taken place, I really read a lot and I wanted to find truth. You have to be willing to change. You have to be willing to take a really honest, hard look. And sometimes it's hard to admit that. Um, the things that I did, the things that I allowed to happen, and to be able to be willing to learn. And one thing that I'm a huge advocate for is getting professional, very good therapy, good counseling. And that has been a tremendous gift for me to be able to start to undo because the complex mind control and and programming that happens and literal brainwashing in a society like the FLDS is it's very hard to undo, especially on your own. So it's been a path. It's been a journey. And yet it also, the best part is, is that it does change. It's little steps and they add up. When did you decide to take your story public, to get involved with helping others that are part of this organization and and actually bring a lot of it down? When did you decide to do all of this? When I left the FLDS and I started to taste choice and to taste equality, to taste respect and freedom and understand my basic human rights, I was then able to quantify the amount of violation that was going on inside of the FLDS, and I knew based on what I experienced as as even the prophet's wife, the amount of violation on every level, and to realize that is not normal, then it gave me just such a fire inside that it has to stop. And I was in a, in a unique position because I was the only one of the prophet's family. That's like the royal family in that culture to escape, to be able to start speaking out, 
to be able to talk about what was going on behind closed doors to really create an effective difference. It was terrifying. Even though I wanted it to change, I wanted the violation to stop, it was the scariest thing for me to be able to go to the authorities and breach that um, the fear that I had of the outside world, but I also knew that I could not live with myself if I did nothing. Are you in touch with any of the other people that got out? I am in touch with some of them that get out. And, you know, everybody leaves a society like this, and they're on their own journey, and, and there's many different paths. Some t- who have left are grateful, and a lot of them are women who experience the same kind of violation. It's interesting, though, because there's for the FLDS men, when they leave that group, they lose a lot of their, their control. They're told from birth, you always have power over women. And yet for the women who leave, it's the most liberating thing because you all of a sudden have freedom and equality. And so there's a, you know, it, it's, it's a mixed perspective for others, whether they agree or disagree with what I've done in the courtroom. And to me, that's, everyone has their individual right. I do have a tremendous amount of love and compassion for the, everybody's journey. And I hope that in the end, everyone will experience peace, they will experience healing, and to be able to understand their human rights and be able to protect those and respect those and others. Rebecca, there are so many different ways that people can become enslaved. What do you believe your life can teach us about the power of choice? I think that one of the greatest gifts of my story is that it is extreme in nature. The details are extreme, and the best part is is it's easy to teach from, and I think that we can see that it doesn't matter if it, it, it did not happen that way overnight, and the FLDS did not become the extreme group of oppression that they are now overnight. This happened in little steps for over 150 years. And for each one of us individually around the globe, we have to take a step back, strip away the names, strip away the titles of people, whether it's a teacher, a preacher, a coach, a parent, a brother, or a sister, and say, what is the behavior here? Is it respecting me? Am I respecting the rights of others? And then judge based on that. And it's time that we we educate and teach skills about that because this is a global problem. And for people around the world, the only way that we can be able to have the change that this society everywhere needs is to be able to understand better how to respect ourselves and respect the rights of others. Rebecca, what is your advice to anyone in a situation where he or she doesn't think that there is an option? And it can be something as extreme as what you went through or just being trapped in a job that they hate. What would you offer to tell that person that they do have options and power over their own life? I would say that you don't have to know all of the steps to get out of your situation. As overwhelming and as stuck as it may seem, that you don't even have any idea of what's next, I would tell them there absolutely is an option, there is choice, and it begins with taking an action. And that might be something small, but just thinking about it is not going to change it. I I thought about getting out of my situation a whole lot, but nothing changed until I climbed over that fence to be able to get to my freedom. And even then, you make one change, you're not in eternal bliss. You have, it's a daily struggle of climbing those fences, of facing those fears, but more than anything, I want them to know, regardless if they have the support of people around them or not, there are people in this world, there are people who can relate, who can give support, and to breathe hope into their courage, into the possibilities of life being better, because everybody deserves to be happy. Everybody deserves to experience equality and to know what choice is, and then to have that freedom to choose. The book is The Witness War Read by Rebecca Musser. If you'd like more information, you can visit her website, RebeccaMusser.com. That's M-U-S-S-E-R.com. Rebecca, thank you so much for being here with us today. As I said in the beginning, it's very difficult for us to understand that in today's day and age, in the United States of America, that there are people with such limited freedom. And I think your message is so powerful about the importance and the value of our freedom, something that a lot of us take for granted, and that we have choices in our life. We are never trapped, and we should never be enslaved. So thank you so much for this really powerful message. I'm so happy that you were here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. We'll be right back. 
Hi, this is Joan Herman, host of Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Did you know that Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life has a free monthly digital magazine that can be read online or emailed to your inbox? Every month, nationally recognized leaders in their field provide information to educate, inspire, and motivate you. We believe in a holistic approach to life, incorporating mind, body, and spirit. Check out a copy of Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life 24-7. Visit CYACYL.com and be sure to tell your friends. You've heard of using essential oils for various health conditions, but did you know that these oils can be just as beneficial to your pet? Hi, I'm Dr. Mia Frezzo, a veterinarian and founder of the Animal Hospital of Hasbrook Heights. I combine holistic and traditional medical care for your pets. Essential oils are the aromatic compounds that are found in plants. These potent oils give plants their characteristic aroma and can fight viruses, bacteria, fungal organisms, tumors, and more. Both pets and people can benefit from the power of pure essential oils, which are proven effective for hundreds of ailments. Essential oils are not new. The history of essential oils dates back to ancient times in which plants were the first medicines. Today, we are returning to a safer, natural approach to illness, and essential oils offer a complementary therapy to traditional medicine since they do not have any side effects and do not interact with any current medications your pet may be taking. Essential oils may be used topically or aromatically or taken internally. Many physical and emotional conditions may be addressed through the use of essential oils ranging from allergies to headaches to indigestion, insomnia, anxiety, and so many more. I'm Dr. Mia Frezzo. For more information, visit VetInHeights.com. Did you know it only takes 15 seconds for a home buyer to make their first impression of your home? Hi, I'm Jocelyn Russo, your real estate expert, here with tips to help you prepare your home for sale. Landscaping, curb appeal, and maintenance are the first things potential buyers see. Make sure your home is attractive on the outside. Then they walk inside and their senses start to kick in. Smell, sound, and sight. Making your home prepared to the highest potential will give the home seller the biggest return on the buck. It's similar to running a marathon. Are you going to wake up one morning and say, hey, I feel like running a 27 mile race today. Preparing for a marathon takes time, energy, and effort, similar to selling a home. Now, what does this mean for sellers? First, walk around your home with your realtor and make a list of items that must be repaired. Clean and declutter. Remove extra furniture, knickknacks, and dust collectors to give the person clear vision of how their belongings will fill the room. A well-staged home translates to a higher selling price. For more information or a free home staging evaluation, please call me at 973-704-4541 or you can find me on Facebook at Jocelyn Russo Realtor. I'm Jocelyn Russo, your real estate expert. We all want to live a happy, productive life, but sometimes we just need a little help. Our Coach on Call experts provide strategies to help you live your best life now. Joining me today is Renee Gambino Bongelo, a success coach, speaker, and thought leader who helps entrepreneurs and career builders up-level their relationship with self and money to discover their true path to accelerate their income and live fully expressed. Welcome, Renee. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Joan. Thank you for having me. Renee, we talk about the mind-body connection on this show, and it makes perfect sense when we're discussing health and wellness, but how does the mind-body connection impact business? What is the mind-body business approach? Joan, what we can look at just to give us a reference point is to see that when it comes to the body, the body has the innate ability to heal itself if given the right environment. And when we take that approach and we look at our career or our business, the same rule applies. The, a business or a career has the innate ability to heal itself if given the right environment. So when we look at our health and wellness, we look at what decision we're going to make in order to have optimum health and wellness. 
So same thing happens in a business. We have to make a decision on what's going to give our business or career optimum health and wellness. So if it's to increase our income, if it's to increase our client base, if it's to move up in our career ladder, we have to diagnose what's going on. So we look at where are we not getting what it is that we really want. Um, where is our business or our career impacting our life and where are they not aligning? And so once we diagnose the problem, you know, then we can look at it and say, okay, what kind of treatment plan do we want to put in place here? So that's about putting a real clear vision together and that would be the course of treatment and then we put together the steps to get there. Is there a formula to be able to do this? Well, we definitely have to start with a clear vision, but one thing that we sort of get caught up in is, is we have this really big vision for our business or our career, and we try to go from A to Z. So what I help people understand is you have to have a clear vision, and that vision should be as big as you can dream, as, as big as you can think. You know, it might even be, you know, a bit out of your comfort zone, which I highly recommend. But what we don't want to do is go, okay, how can I get from there to this big vision, you know, in a month? So what I help people understand is a vision is exactly that. It's a vision. And then from there we have goals. And Goals are actually outcomes. Goals are not tasks. So when we decide what our goals are, we put together outcomes. So for some of my clients, what we might look at is they want to make $500,000 a year, and they want to buy a bigger house, and they want to send their child to private school. Okay, so that's their vision. So when we shorten up the goals, which I always recommend doing goals in 60-day format, what we're looking at is outcomes. So if what they're looking to do in 60 days is increase their income by $10,000, that's the outcome. That's the goal. Or they want to increase their client base by 20 new clients in the next 60 days. That's the outcome. So from there, what we do is a list of tasks. And I like to be careful with this with my clients because what people find is a list of tasks turned from a to-do list to a should-do list. So it's a list of things they should be doing, but they're not. So what I call lists of tasks, Joan, is acts of willingness. So when we list our acts of willingness, these are things that we're actually willing to do. And we have to step back and we have to say, am I actually willing to do this? And if you're not, you need to get clear on why. And what I would recommend is you set up um, the support and accountability you need to figure out why, or are these things that should be delegated? So this is how I get people to step things down. You start from a big vision, and then you start from 60-day outcomes, which are your goals, and then your list of tasks of the things that need to be done in order to, to achieve them. And once again, I really, really, really want to stress that those tasks are things that you're actually going to be willing to do. Otherwise, you're just setting yourself up for failure. Renee, thank you so much for being here with us today and for this wonderful reminder that there is a mind-body connection in all aspects of our life. If you'd like to get more information about Renee, you can visit her website, starians.com. for joining us today. We hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided are the opinions of our guests and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on the site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, take part in the book club, and be sure to follow the show on Facebook and Twitter. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.